Well, it's good to see each of you on this Holy Sabbath day. Welcome all of you, particularly if you're here for the first time. We're glad that you're here. And on this uh, holiday weekend, it's good to see a lot of our college students are home. And some are sitting on the front row, or close to the front. Good to have you here. Well, I want you to know in John's Gospel, there's never mention of John called John the Baptist. He's not mentioned, he's not called that. I would call him John the Witness rather than John the Baptist. He, um, interestingly, if you follow the scripture reading, he is with his disciples. John had his own disciples. And they see Jesus walk by. And John says to them, Behold the Lamb of God. And then John's disciples leave him and follow Jesus. I wonder how John felt about that. I wonder about how he felt about his disciples leaving him and following Jesus. You know, all through the Gospels, all of the Gospels, John plays second fiddle to Jesus. We would even say that John the Witness, or John the Baptist, was in the shadow of Jesus. Some people don't like to play second fiddle. When I read this, I reminded, uh, this is uh, Baby Recognition Sunday, I remember when our second child came along. Our daughter Meredith was two and a half when Emory was born. My parents brought him to the hospital, brought her, Meredith to the hospital for me to show her her new brother. She'd been an only child until then. And I took her in my arms and walked down to where you could see the babies in that baby room. And they brought the little card up and and I showed her, I said, Meredith, this is your baby brother. And I said it with excitement and enthusiasm. She looked at him and screamed. And she jumped out of my arms and she ran down the hall screaming and crying. And I had to run chase her and pick her up. And she was so upset, I had to take her home. I told King, I said, I've got to take her home. She's so upset about this. And I just loved on her. And you know, um, she never did like playing second fiddle to him. That rivalry only lasted about 17 years. And um, then she finally got over it. <laughs> There's sisters, though, who never got over it. I saw over Christmas that the actress Joan Fontaine died. Many of you do not know that name, but some of us older know Joan Fontaine. Her sister is the famous Olivia de Havilland, who played Melanie in Gone with the Wind. Olivia is older than Joan, and Joan was the first to win an Academy Award as a lead actress in a movie, and that made Olivia angry. In fact, Joan was the first to get all notoriety before Olivia ever did. And even though Olivia won two Academy Awards for lead, uh, actress in a lead movie, she never spoke to her sister after 1960. Never. And did not know of her death until way after it happened. She refused to speak to her. You know that Jesus was the cousin of, of younger cousin of John and that he received more attention, never seemed to bother John He was the forerunner of Jesus. He went ahead and he pointed people to Jesus, and we never read that it bothered him at all. He knew what he was to do, and that was to point people to Jesus. And he pointed those disciples to to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And there was something about Jesus that the disciples immediately left John and started following Jesus. And Jesus senses their following, and he turns around and says, What are you looking for? What are you looking for? Well, I want to suggest that that's the fundamental question of life and of religion. Why are you here today? What are you looking for? What are you looking for in life? What are you looking for in your faith? It's an essential question. Unfortunately, too many people live their lives looking for money. I've known many to sell their souls to be rich. Many who've neglected their families who've neglected integrity and ethics to get to the top. And if that's what we're looking for, then it's a very low goal. Some people are looking for power and fame and prestige, and once again, that's a low goal. I've known many to look for peace. Say, I just want peace in my life. I want peace in my soul with God, with others. Now, those are worthy goals. He asked them, what are you looking for? And they say, where are you staying? In other words, they're asking him, how can we be near you? How can we be near you? How can we know you better? 
Where can we find you? And Jesus says, come and see. Come and see. I think it's interesting. The author of John's Gospel says it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon. That's pretty significant. Day is coming to an end, and, you know, whoever Jesus was staying with uh, didn't know he was going to bring company. Wonder how the women of the household at that day who prepared the food thought about that. Just come on and bring guests. And we get the impression they were there a good little while. But there was something about this Jesus that sparked a holy flame in a, in a man named Andrew. And Andrew, before he goes to Jesus where he's staying, he goes home and gets his brother Peter and brings Peter back. And in meeting Jesus, Simon, who first was named Simon before he was Peter, was so entranced and excited about this Christ encounter. And Jesus obviously was impressed with him that he changes his name. In that first encounter, I've changed your name. You'll no longer be Simon, you're going to be called Peter. Now I wonder how Andrew felt about that. Now here, Andrew's the one that went and got Peter. He was the brother who never got a lot of recognition. Who has the most recognition in the Bible, Andrew or Peter? Peter does. It's very interesting in the Roman Catholic Church that all popes are supposed to have some to be descended from Peter. St. Peter's Basilica, where the pope is, and the, and the headquarters of the Roman Catholic Church is about Peter. But the purpose of the church isn't to receive notoriety and status and fame. The purpose of why we're here is to help us to know Christ and be in that relationship with Christ in such a way that we leave from here and we go out and point others to Jesus. And we never know who all that's going to affect. It's kind of like throwing a stone in a lake. You don't know the ripple effect. Does the name Mordecai Ham mean anything to anyone here? Probably never heard that name. Mordecai Ham was an evangelist in 1934. He was conducting a revival in North Carolina. He didn't know the people there. He offered an invitation to come and meet the risen Christ. And a gangly 16-year-old, tall 16-year-old boy came down and gave his life to Christ. Now, if you ask Mordecai Ham what he thought about that night, he wondered, well, did I do much good? Was it really beneficial? Little did he realize that that gangly 16-year-old boy was Billy Graham, who came down and gave his life to Christ. You've never heard of Mordecai Ham, but there's not a person here, I don't believe. You've heard of Billy Graham, haven't you? Look how many people he's pointed to Christ. Each of us have the ability to be John the Witness. We can point others to Christ. I want to make sure that every person sitting here, whether you're a member of this church or not, wherever you go to church, you're on the invite committee. You're on the evangelism committee. Did you realize that? All of you are on the evangelism committee, whether you want it or not. You're either pointing people to Christ or away from Christ. What are you doing in your life? You're on the evangelism committee. When you leave here every day, wherever you are every day, you're on that committee. Don't ever forget it. And I challenge us all to reach out this week and bring someone with you to church. Don't go looking for people who are going to other churches. That's called proselyting. We're not asking you to do that. Look around in your school, your neighborhood, your workplace. Who are the people in your workplace or wherever you are, people around that do not go to church? Invite them to come. I would go a step further. Look for people that you're around who are hurting. People are hurting. Everywhere I go in life, I see people hurting. Bring them to meet the living Christ. God is at work, my friends, when we invite people. Do you know that 80%, it's been proven, 80% of people who come to church do not come to church for the pastor. They don't come for the music. They don't come for programs. They come because someone invited them to church. I want you to hear that. That's how important we all are in this business. There are too many people who have a void and a hurt in their life. And you know what they're doing? It They're filling that void with destructive things. You know what I mean. With drugs or alcohol, adultery, stealing, sex trafficking, rape, gangs, all kinds of horribly destructive things that people 
are doing to fill that void and that hurt in their lives when what they need is to come and see. Come and see and to meet the one who can heal their hurts and change their lives and transform them to really live. A young man grew up in a family in the, toward the Maine, lived in Maine area of the United States. And his father and mother, as he was growing up, both of them expressed vehement negativity about homosexuality. And they would say to time to time to their children, I would rather you be dead than gay. They would say that to their children. Well, their son, knowing himself to be gay, hid deeper and deeper in his closet of security. And when the time came for him to go off to college, he went to California, all the way across the country from his parents. He rarely ever went home. And when he graduated from the university, he was brilliant and became a professor on that campus. But his life uh, drifted into the gay ghetto, and ultimately he contracted AIDS. And when it was diagnosed, it wasn't HIV as much as it was full-blown AIDS. And the doctor said, you will not live long. And his deepest desire was to reconcile with his parents. He didn't know how to do that. And the reason I know this is because he went to a United Methodist chaplain on the campus of that university. And he said, I want, I want to be with my family again. How can I make that happen? And they talked about it for a while, and they both decided the best thing to do was to write the parents a letter. And so they carefully crafted it, addressed it, and mailed it. And 10 days later, he received a reply. And when the letter came to his home, he was too nervous to open it, and he took it to the chaplain, the Methodist chaplain on the campus, and he said, would you open this? And the chaplain said yes, and he opened it up, and he took out a blank sheet of paper, and when he unfolded the piece of paper, torn pieces of a printed document fell out. It was that young man's birth certificate. Now, I have to tell you, I can't comprehend that kind of rejection. But I have to tell you, in my years in ministry, I've seen parents and families reject people for all kinds of things. People are hurting. Divorce has caused many families to be shattered. Chemical abuse has torn families apart. Neglect. Jealousy, greed, bitterness. There are all kinds of things that tear people apart and families apart. Who do you know that's hurting? Who do you know? Point them to Jesus Christ. Go and find them and bring them to meet the living Christ who can heal our wounds and bring us eternal living. You don't have to go to seminary to know how to do that. You don't even have to take a class. You don't have to go say anything, uh, preach a sermon. St. Francis said, preach always, and if necessary, use words. Tell people what Christ has done for you. I hope we all live in such a way that people say, I want what you have. And you say, come and see. Let me tell you, come and be and meet the one who can bring life and heal your hurts. That's what we're about. We're not about just trying to raise people to come here so we say, look how many we've got on the rolls for the conference. It's not what it's about. It's about intentionality, changing a hurting world. Brian Funderburg didn't tell you that, because we didn't get into all this, but one of our young people who grew up in this church was here this morning. And uh, Ingrid Peterson is getting ready to move north of Afghanistan. She has lived all over the world. But one of her closest friends was sitting at a restaurant in Afghanistan and was bomb blew up. 21 were killed. 
she's hurting. There's something wrong with a world where people pick up guns and go kill people. And people kill people by their words and their actions. We've got to change this. We've got to change this world. And you know how it's going to be changed? It's through invitation. You come. Come and see. Come and see. Let me invite you to know the one who can turn this world upside down. I want to ask a favor of you. It's a part of the sermon. I'm almost through. But this is a part of the sermon. Will you turn your hymnal to page 375? This was one of my mother's favorite hymns. I'm going to ask Kristen Swatch who's going to come and lead us. She's going to sing the first and third stanzas. And let me give you some instructions. She's going to sing the first and third stanzas, but I want you to notice real carefully what those words say. But we're all going to sing the chorus together, and we're going to start out singing the chorus, and she's going to sing the first stanza, we'll sing the chorus, she's going to sing the third, and then the chorus. Notice the words of this hymn. They say what I've been trying to say far better. Let's sing together. remind you that the Hebrew translation of the word salvation comes from the root word sav. That's like a balm, a healing balm put on a womb that makes a person whole. Salvation means to be made whole. And it is here that that can happen. Yes, there's a hurting world out there and people have a lot on them. And many of us sitting right here may think we're not worthy to go out and do anything or think we have the talents, but we do. If you can't preach like Peter and can't pray like Paul, then just tell the love of Jesus and say he died for all. I love those words. God is at work in our lives when we do just that, my friends. In just a minute, you're going to be invited to the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's where Jesus is the host of the meal, and he says, come and see. Come spend time with me, and when we eat of this, we are filled with his life. We are filled with his life. 
It doesn't matter if you're a member of this church. It doesn't matter if you feel worthy. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter at all. Come. You are welcome. This is the, the table of Jesus Christ. Come and see and know the Christ, the one who can change our lives and heal our hurts and who sends us out to change the world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen? Amen.